very elaborate introduction all arranged for our next speaker. But he said, nope, 15 seconds is all the time you are allotted to introduce me. Charles Jones is from Pennsylvania, president of Life Management Services Incorporated. He's written a book called Life is Tremendous, which is sold to Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Tremendous Jim. Thank you. Now, let me explain hurriedly why I told Jim he may take 15 seconds to introduce me. After more than 30 years of going to meetings and seminars and congresses, I have discovered something all of you know, that the longer the introducer spends introducing the speaker, the deeper in trouble the poor speaker gets. Now, if you've been to many meetings, and I know you have, you know the meetings usually begin like this. Ladies and gentlemen, what a speaker we've got for you! Woohoo! He's done this and that and that and, and little by little, Jim. When you rave like that over a speaker, you don't realize, but you alienate a lot of the young people because they begin to think nobody's that good. <laughs> so that's why I've made it a point give them 15 seconds and quick. Cut them off. And Jim, it's a good thing I only gave you 15 seconds. Because in the little time you had, you were beginning to louse that up. <laughs> now, first off, normally they have enough time. They'll say, Charlie Jones has six children. I say, that's true. We do have six children. But let me explain why. Wait, wait, wait. Please, please. Wait. Wait for the punchline. Let me explain why we only have six. The reason we only have six children is my wife hates kids. That's why. Then you'll notice another thing, when, and with Larry, you'll notice when they introduce speakers, they always give you their credentials to let you know you're about to hear from another heavy hitter. So they always will throw in something like, Mr. Jones built a hundred million dollar insurance business. Then you watch. When the meeting is over, some tiger will meet me out in the hall and he'll say, did you really do that? I say, I sure did. So well, how many people did you have in your organization to do that? I say, you mean full-time people? We never had any full-time people. We had a kind of organization, when somebody would show up for a meeting, we'd have a victory rally. <laughs> <laughs> and naturally, Jim would have told you about my book, too, and they'll usually say, Mr. Jones's book is in its seventh printing. Even that isn't the whole truth. They don't lie to you. They just don't tell you the whole truth. My book is in its seventh printing, but the reason it's in its seventh printing is because the first six were blurred. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I've been with you a few moments. You know what I've done in a few moments? I've just done the two things you've got to be learning to do if you're going to have a tremendous life. And life is tremendous, but life has already been said a lot of ways. You have the choice. And if your life is going to be tremendous, you'll have to be learning to do two things I've just done with you. Number one. If you're going to have a tremendous life, you've got to be learning how to laugh at your failures. Laughing at your failures doesn't mean you like to fail. It just means if you're not learning to capitalize on what goes wrong, you'll never do as much as you could have done. Once a young man said to me, Mr. Jones, what's an ingredient of success? Good judgment. Well, how do you get that? Experience. Well, how do you get that? Poor judgment. <laughs> One. One. It is impossible for any normal person to like to fail, but if you're not learning how to capitalize on what goes wrong, you'll never do as much as you could have done. Two, if you're going to have a tremendous life, you'll have to be learning how to get people to laugh at themselves. A few years ago, a young man that everybody loved killed himself. His name was Freddie Prince. If you remember, they called him Chico. You also rem may remember the morning after, when Chico died, the newspapers said when his heart stopped beating, a young nurse fell over his chest, beating on his heart, screaming, please, don't die, Freddie. The world needs all the laughter it can get. Do you know what hit me when I read that? The same thing that still hits me every time I make the point. Why is it? So few people in life ever start learning, even people who want to be successful, even people who call so-called leaders. Why is it so few people in life ever start learning that life is not for me to get you to notice me? 
or laugh at me. Life is not for you to get people to notice you or laugh at you. Life, basically, is for each of us to be learning to see things more like it is, and as we discover things more like they really are, be learning how to get people around us in our sphere of influence to laugh a little at themselves while we all get a bigger, better job done. And I hope my contribution, as I wind up this wonderful morning, I hope my contribution to your life will be twofold. Because we thought and laughed together for a few minutes, You'll hate to fail as much as you ever hated it in your life, but when you do, you'll be better equipped to get a laugh and get on with it. And number two, when you go back to the trenches to do your fighting and achieving wherever you do it, you'll be better equipped to get some people to laugh at themselves while we all get a bigger, better job done. Now, this morning I would like to, to share with you about one of the greatest things I've been learning over the years working with people. I've discovered in working with people that life is not a joke. You don't have to be a comedian to be successful. But I've been learning this, perhaps more than any other single thing about working with people. I've been learning that young people hurt just like old people, and I've been learning that old people hurt just like young people. I've been learning that sometimes rich people hurt like poor people, and sometimes well people hurt like sick people. I've discovered you can't take hurt out of life, even your own, but there are some ways to make hurt better rather than bitter. And the greatest tool I've discovered in my life to make hurt better rather than bitter is a tool called laughter. And I guess you now know Dr. Cousins and many of the other great uh, um, people in the field are now actually experimenting with laughter and getting results with laughter on cancer patients. I'm flying back home Sunday for a surprise birthday party for a dear friend of mine, 80 years old, should be dead right now, but the past four months, almost a lot of prayer and other things, but laughter this man, Carl Wharton, is living. We're going to have a surprise birthday party. Laughter. And yet, there are people who don't know how to use laughter. Now, this, though, basically is a laughing group. Now, tell I can tell. <laughs> See that? They didn't even tell a joke. They started laughing. See that? Jim, I could tell it right away. They were laughing because when you stood up here to start the session out, before you opened your mouth, I heard a lot of snickers all around. See, right away. That, now, see, that that tipped me off. You ever laugh? Because, see, laughers, laughers love to laugh. You don't need to tell a joke. All you do for a laugh is just pause. <laughs> Having fun. In fact, now, seriously, did you ever notice it's hard to be serious with laughers? They want to laugh when you want to be serious. You ever notice that? Now, look at that. Nothing funny, and everybody's laughing already. Now, however, I stood back there, and I studied every person here while I watched all of you speak. And I can tell you there are several non-laughhers in this group. Yes. Don't worry, I'm not pointing you out. You know who you are. Now, but you are going to be thrilled with what I've got for you if you're a non laugher Because according to my research, according to my research, non laughers have just as much fun as laughers. <laughs> they just don't like to show it. So if you're a non laugher and you're surrounded by a bunch of laughers, let me tell you, don't you let those laughers intimidate you. <laughs> because you don't have to laugh to make money. You don't have to laugh to have fun. You don't have to laugh to recruit, train. You don't. But I'll tell you what I've been learning about people. I've been learning that half the success in a home, half the success in a church, half the success in a sale and interview, half the success in anything is atmosphere. Atmosphere. And anybody with any sensitivity knows atmosphere doesn't come out of thin air. Somebody has to create atmosphere. And you tell me a quicker, cheaper way to create some atmosphere than a good smile or a good laugh. <laughs> Brother. So... Today, practice. The meeting is almost over. The seminar is almost over. You're going back to the trenches. So practice now. When you feel like laughing, let it out. Let it out. Don't, don't, watch non-laughers. <laughs> come on. The meeting's almost over. When you feel like laughing, let it out. Let it out. Because when you feel like laughing, if you don't let it out, it sinks back down into your hips. <laughs> it's too late for a lot of you. Yes, you're, you're, you're too late for you. You too, wait too late for you.